Tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm honored to introduce Amy Bloom to discuss her latest collection of stories, Where the God of Love Hangs Out. The dozen stories in Where the God of Love Hangs Out examine the unconventional relationships that develop in unlikely places. In the title story, a married man admits his love for a young woman over a basket of sweet potato fries to the wife of his son. New stories from the Lionel and Julia group will surprise Miss Bloom's devoted readers and challenge newcomers to visit their complex relationship. The Boston Globe describes her writing as holding the reader in thrall. Bloom shows us her character's inner lives and all their deeply human and all their deeply human complexity. Amy Bloom is the author of five previous books, <coughs> including the critically acclaimed Away. A Blind Man Can See How Much I Love You, and the National Book Award finalists come to me. She teaches creative writing at Wesleyan University and contributes to The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, and Vogue. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Amy Bloom. Well, I want to thank you for coming to an independent bookstore to these are really the only places I read anymore. And um, I'm always glad to see that their doors are still open. Um, and I was even glad to see, sort of, that they didn't have a coffee bar. I thought that that spoke, it was bad news for me. But it was really good news for their integrity. And I thought that was very nice. So instead of buying a cup of coffee, you should buy another book. It doesn't have to be mine. It could be somebody else's. Um, The front half of the book are two sets of linked short stories. They're quartets. They're really sort of my wish to split the difference between short stories and, um, and a novel, um, just because I tend to try to put off writing the novel as long as possible. Um, and um, this short story is the last in a quartet about William and Claire, a pair of friends who are part of a foursome of friends, middle-aged people, who find themselves falling in love. Um, the story is called Compassion and Mercy. <clears throat> There's no power. The roads were thick with pine branches and whole birch trees, the heavy boughs breaking off and landing on top of houses and cars and in front of driveways. The low, looping power lines coiled onto the road, and even from their bedroom window, Claire could see silver branches dangling in the icy wires. Highways were closed. Classes were canceled. The phone didn't work. The front steps were slippery as hell. And William kept a fire going in the living room, and Claire toasted rye bread on the end of fondue forks for breakfast. They used the snowbank at the kitchen door to chill the wine. They read and played Scrabble, and at four o'clock, when daylight dropped to a deep indigo, Claire lit two dozen candles, and they got into their pile of quilts and pillows. All right, William said, let's have it. You find yourself shipwrecked on a desert island. Who do you want to be with, me or Nelson Slater? Oh my God, Claire says, Nelson, of course. It's a good choice. That kid did a great job with the firewood. And William kept the fire going all night, and every hour he had to roll sideways and crouch and then steady himself and then pull himself up with his cane and then balance himself. And because Claire was watching and worried, he had to do it all with the appearance of ease. And Claire lay in the dark and tried to move the blankets far to one side so they wouldn't tangle up William's feet. Hang on. There's a seat over here and over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're not actually helping, William said. I know where the blankets are, so I can easily step over them, and then, of course, you keep moving them. I feel bad, Claire said. I'm going to break something if you keep helping. Let me help, Claire said. And when the cold woke them, Claire handed William the logs, and they talked about whether or not it was worth it to use the turkey carcass for soup, and if he could really make a decent soup in the fireplace. And William said that people had cooked primarily in hearths until the late 18th century. And William told Claire about his visit to his cardiologist and the possible levels of fitness that he thought William could achieve. A lot of men your age walk five miles a day, the doctor said. My father-in-law got himself a personal trainer, and he's 80. And Claire said that maybe they could walk to the diner on weekends. And they talked about Claire's sons, Adam and Danny, and their wives, and the two grandchildren. And they talked about William's daughter, Emily, and her pregnancy, and the awful man she'd married. 
I'd rather she'd taken the veil, William said, little sisters of Gehenna. And when the subject came up, William and Claire said nice things about the people they used to be married to. It had taken them five years to end their marriages. And William's divorce lawyer was the sister of one of William's old friends. She was William's age, in a sharp black suit and improbably black hair and blood red nails, and her only concession to age was black patent flats. And William was sure that most of her life, this woman had been stalking and killing wild game in stiletto heels with her bare hands. So, she said, you've been married 35 years. Well, look, Dr. Langford, Mr. is fine, William said. William is fine. Bill, the woman said, and William shook his head. Just kidding, it's like this. Unless your wife is doing crack cocaine or having sex with young girls and Barnard animals, what little you have will be split 50-50. That's fine, William said. Not really, the woman said. You call me Louise. Your wife obviously got a lawyer long before you did. It's fine, he said, whatever it is. It's not fine, she said, but let's say you have no personal attachment to any of the things she wants, and let's say it's all worth about $20,000. Let's have her give you $20,000 and you give her the stuff. There's no reason for you just to roll over and put your paws up in the air. Whatever she wants, William said. You, you should know, I'm not having sex with, you know, graduate students or porn stars. I believe you, she said. You might as well tell me it'll all come out in the wash. Who are you having sex with? Her name is Claire Wexler, and she teaches. She's a very fine teacher, and she makes me laugh. She can be a difficult person, he said, beaming as if he were detailing her beauty. You'd like her, and William wiped his eyes. All right, said the lawyer. Let's get you hitched before we're all too old to enjoy it. And when they could finally marry, Claire called her sons. Danny said, you might want a prenup. I'm just saying. And Adam said, geez, I thought Isabel was your friend. And William called his daughter, and Emily said, how can you do this to me? I'm trying to get pregnant. And her husband, Kurt, had to take the phone because she was crying so hard. And Kurt said, we're trying not to take sides, you know. Three days after the storm had passed, classes resumed, and grimy cars filled slushy roads, and Claire called both of her sons to say that they were essentially unharmed. What do you mean, essentially, Danny said, and Claire said, I mean, my hair's a mess, and I lost at Scrabble 17 times, and William's back hurts from sleeping near the fireplace. I'm completely and absolutely fine. I shouldn't have said essentially. And William laughed and shook his head when she hung up. They should know me by now, Claire said. I'm sure they do, William said, but knowing and understanding are two different things, Verstehen und Erklären. Fancy talk, Claire said. And she kissed his neck and the bald top of his head and the little red dents behind his ears, which came from 65 years of wearing glasses. I have to go to Baltimore tomorrow, remember? Of course, William said. But she knew he would call her the next day to ask about dinner, and when she reminded him that she was on her way to Baltimore, he would be, for just a quick minute, crushed and then crisp in English. And they spoke while Claire was on the train. William unpacked his low-salt, low-fat lunch. This is disgusting, he said. This is punitive. And Claire had gone over her notes for her talk on Jane Eyre, in which I will reveal my awful retrograde underpinnings, she said. And they made their nighttime phone date for 10 o'clock when William would still be at his desk at home and Claire would be in her bed at the university club. She called him every half hour from 10 until midnight and then she told herself that he must have fallen asleep early and she called him at his university office and on his cell phone and at home. She called him every 15 minutes from 7 a.m. until her talk, and she began calling him again at 11 as soon as her talk was over. She begged off the faculty lunch. She said she was needed at home, and her voice shook, and no one doubted her. On the train, Claire wondered who to call. She couldn't ask Emily, even though she lived only six blocks away. You couldn't really say to a pregnant woman, go see if your father was all right. <coughs> By the time she would have gotten Emily to understand what was required and where the house key was hidden and that there was no real cause for alarm, Emily would be sobbing and Claire would be trying not to scream at Emily to calm the fuck down. Isabel was the person to call, and Claire couldn't call her, but she could imagine Isabel saying, of course, Claire, leave it to me, and driving straight down from Boston to sort things out and making the beds and gathering the overdue library books into a pile and scolding William for making them all worry, and then she would call Claire back to say that all broken things had been put right. She couldn't picture what might have happened to William. His face floated before her his large, lovely face, his face when he was reading the newspaper, his face when he had said to her, I am sorry. And she had thought, oh Christ, we're breaking up again. I thought we'd go until April at least, and he had said, you are everything to me. I'm so sorry, I'm afraid we have to marry. 
and they cried so hard they had to sit down on the bench outside the diner and wipe each other's faces with napkins. Claire saw the man in the seat across from her, smiling uncertainly. She must have been saying William's name out loud. She walked to the little juncture between cars and called Margaret Slater, her former cleaning lady, and there was no answer. If Margaret had a cell phone, Claire didn't know the number. Claire called every half hour home and then Margaret's number, leaving messages and timing herself, reading a few pages of the paper. God damn it, Margaret, she thought you're retired. Pick up the fucking phone. And Claire pulled into their driveway just as the sun was setting and Margaret pulled in right after her. Water still dripped from the gutters and the corners of the house and it would all freeze again at night. Oh, Claire, Margaret said, I just got your messages. I was out of the house all day, I'm so sorry. It's all right, Claire said, and they both looked up at the light in William's window. He probably unplugged the phone. They live to drive us crazy, Margaret said. And Claire scrabbled in the bottom of her bag for the house key, furiously tossing tissues and pens and chapsticks and quarters onto the sidewalk and thinking with every toss, what's your hurry? This is your last moment of not knowing, stupid. Slow down. But her hands moved fast, tearing at the silk lining of the bag until she saw out of the corner of her eye a brass house key sitting in Margaret's flat-lined palm. She wanted to sit down on the porch and wait for someone else to come. But Claire opened the door, and then she wanted to turn right around and close it behind her. They should call his name, she thought. It's what you do when you come into your house and you haven't been able to reach your husband. You go, William, William, darling, I'm home. And then he pulls himself out of his green leather desk chair and comes to the top of the stairs, his hair standing straight up and his glasses on the end of his nose, and he says, relief and annoyance clearly mixed, oh, darling, you didn't call. I waited for your call. And then you say, I did call. I called all night, but the phone was off the hook. You had the phone off. And he says that he certainly did not. And Margaret just watches, bemused. She disapproved of the divorce. She had all but said to you, I always thought Charles would leave you, not the other way around. But she had given herself over on the wedding day and brought platters of deviled eggs and put her grandson in a navy blue suit, and she had cried. Fulgent, William had said after the ceremony, and he said it several times, a little drunk on champagne. Absolutely fulgent. It wouldn't have mattered if no one had been there, but everyone had been, and they got in one elegant foxtrot before William's ankle acted up. And William will call down, I'm so sorry we inconvenienced you, Mrs. Slater, and Margaret will shake her head fondly and go home. And you drop your coat and bag in the hall, and he comes down the stairs slowly, careful with his ankle, and he makes tea to apologize for having scared the shit out of you. And Margaret waited. As much as she wanted to help, it wasn't her house or her husband, and Claire had been in charge of their relationship for the last 20 years. This was not the moment to take the lead. Claire walked up the stairs and right into their bedroom as if William had phoned ahead and told her what to expect. He was lying on the bed, shoes off and fully dressed, his hand on Jane Eyre, his eyes closed and his reading glasses on his chest. He is not to them what he is to me, Jane Eyre thought. While I breathe and think, I must love him. And Claire lay down next to him, murmuring until Margaret put her hand on Claire's shoulder and asked if she should call the hospital or someone. I have no idea, Claire said, lying on the bed beside William, staring at the ceiling. These things get done, Claire thought, whether you know what you're doing or not. The hospital is called, the funeral home is contacted, the body is removed with some difficulty because he was a big man, and the stairs are old and narrow, and your sons and daughters-in-law call everyone who needs to be called, and Margaret comes back the next day and makes up one of the boys' bedrooms for you, just in case. But when your best friend flies in from Cleveland, you are lying in your own room, wrapped in William's bathrobe, and you wear his robe and his undershirt while she sits across from you, her sensible shoes right beside William's wingtips. And she helps you decide, chapel or funeral home, lunch or brunch, booze or wine, who will speak. And your sons and their wives and the babies come, and it is no more or less terrible to have them in the house. You move slowly and carefully, swimming through a deep but traversable river of shit. You must not inhale, you must not stop. You really must not stop for anything at all. Destroyed and untouchable, you can lie down on the other side when they have all gone home. Claire was careful during the funeral. She didn't listen to anything that was said. She saw Isabel sitting with her daughter Emily and Kurt, a little cluster of Langfords, and Isabel wore a gray suit and held Emily's hand, and she left as soon as the service ended. At the house, Claire imagined Isabel beside her. She imagined herself encased in Isabel. Even in pajamas, even suffering a bad cold, Isabel always moved like a woman in beautiful silk. 
and Claire made an effort to move that way. She thanked people in Isabel's pleasant, governessy voice. She straightened Danny's tie with Isabel's hand and white chocolate fingerprints off the back of a chair. She used Isabel to answer every question and to make plans to get together with people she had no intention of seeing. And she hugged Emily the way Isabel would have with a perfect degree of appreciation for Emily's pregnant and furious state. And she went upstairs and lay down on the big bed and cried into the big tailored pillows William used for reading in bed. She held his reading glasses like a rosary. On the bed, she rearranged their two unlikely stuffed animals. Oh, rhino and peckerbird, William had said. That's how he saw the two of them. And a few years ago, she had found herself in front of a fancy toy store in Guilford on a spring afternoon and bought a very expensive plush gray rhino and a velvety little brown and white bird, and she was putting the pair on their bed that night. You're not so tough, William had said. I was, Claire said. You've ruined me. Claire wanted to talk with Isabel about Emily. They used to talk about her all the time. Once after William's second heart attack, when William was still Isabel's husband, Isabel and Claire were playing cards in William's hospital room, and Emily and Kurt had just gone off to get sandwiches, and Claire had stumbled over something nice to say about Kurt, and Isabel had slapped down her cards and said, you can just say what you want. He's dumb in that awful preppy way, and a Republican, and if he says no disrespect intended one more time, I'm going to set him on fire. And William said, de gustibus non est disputandum, which he said about many things, and Isabel said, that really doesn't help, darling. William looked at William's lapis cufflinks and at the watch she'd given him when they were in the third act of their affair. You can't give me a watch, he said. I already have a perfectly good one. And Claire took his watch off his wrist and laid it on the asphalt and drove over it twice. There, she said. It was a terrible accident. You were so careless, you had to replace it. And William took that beautiful watch she'd bought him out of the box and kissed her in the parking lot of a Marriott halfway between his home and hers, and he had worn it every day until last Thursday. And Claire walked downstairs holding William's jewelry, and she dropped the watch into Danny's pocket, and she dropped the lapis cufflinks in Adam's free hand. William particularly wanted you to have these, she said, and Adam looked surprised, as well he might, Claire thought. Claire took the semester off. She spent weeks in the public library, crying and wandering up and down the mystery section, looking for something she hadn't read. And a woman she didn't know popped out from behind the stacks and handed her a little ivory pamphlet, the pages held together with a dark blue silk ribbon. And on the front it said, God never gives us more than we can bear. And the woman ran off, and Claire caught the eye of the librarian who mouthed the words, and Claire carried it with her to the parking lot and looked over her shoulder to make sure the woman was gone, and then she tossed it in the trash. After the library, she always went to the coffee house or to the Turkish restaurant where they knew how to treat widows. And every evening at six, men would spill out of the church across the street, they would smoke in the vestibule, and they would sit down to play chess. And one evening, one of the older men with a tidy silver crew cut and pants yanked up a little too high approached Claire. The man said gently, are you waiting for the meeting? Claire said in her Isabel voice that it was very kind of him to ask, but there was no meeting she was waiting for. He said, well, I see you here a lot. I thought maybe you were trying to decide whether or not to go to the next meeting. And Claire said she hadn't made up her mind, which could have been true. She could just as soon have gone to an AA meeting as to a no rest for the weary meeting or a people sick of life meeting. And she did know something about drinking. Some time after she and William had decided for the thousandth time that their affair was a terrible thing, that their love for their spouses was much greater than their love for each other, that William and Isabel were suited, just like Charles and Claire were suited, and that the William and Claire thing was nothing more than some odd summer lightning that would pass as soon as the season changed, Claire found herself having three glasses of wine every night. Her goal every night was to climb into bed, exhausted and tipsy, and fall deeply asleep before she could say anything to her husband about William. It was her version of one day at a time, and it worked for two years until she woke up crying and saying William's name into her pillow over and over again, and she didn't think that was the kind of reckless behavior that interested the people at the meeting across the street. The man put AA for the older alcoholic in front of Claire and said, you're not alone. Claire said, that is so not true.
She kept the orange and gray pamphlet on her kitchen table for a few weeks in case anyone dropped in because it made her laugh, the whole idea. Her favorite part, and she had several, especially the stoic recitation of ruined marriages, dead children, estranged children, alcoholic children, multiple car accidents, pedestrian and vehicular, forced resignations, outright firings, embezzlements, failed suicides, and diabetic comas. Her absolute favorite in the category of the telling detail was an old woman carrying a fifth of vodka hidden in a bag of yarn. And Claire finally put the pamphlet away so it wouldn't worry Nelson when he came for Friday night dinners. His grandmother dropped him off at 6 and picked him up at 8.30, which gave her time for bingo and Nelson and Claire time to eat and play checkers. Nelson didn't know that William's pajamas were still under Claire's pillow, the bedroom still smelled like his cologne, that his wingtips and his homely black sneakers were in the bottom of the bedroom closet. He knew that William's canes were still in the umbrella stand and the refrigerator was filled with his favorite foods. But Nelson didn't mind. He had known and loved Claire most of his young life, and he understood old people craziness. His great aunt believed that every event in the Bible actually happened and left behind physical evidence that you could buy, like the splinter from Noah's Ark she kept by her bed. <laughs> and his cousin Chick had sat on the back porch shooting the heads off squirrels and chipmunks and reciting poetry. Nelson had known William Langford since he was five, and he had gotten used to him. Mr. Langford was a big man with a big laugh and a big frown, and he gave Nelson credit for who he was and what he did around the house, and he paid Nelson, which Claire never remembered to. A man has to make a living, Mr. Langford said one time, and Nelson did like that. And Nelson liked the Friday night dinners, and unless Claire started doing something really weird, like setting three places at the table, he would keep coming over. Claire put the pork and apple on Nelson's plate and poured them both apple cider. And when Nelson lifted the fork to his mouth and chewed and then sighed and smiled, happy to be loved and fed, Claire had to leave the kitchen for a minute. After a year, everything was much the same. Claire fed Nelson on Friday nights. She taught half time. She cried in the shower. And at the end of every day, she put on one of William's button-down shirts and a pair of his socks and settled down with a big book of William's or an English mystery. When the phone rang, Claire jumped. Claire, how are you? Oh, good, Lauren, how are you? How's Adam? Her daughter-in-law would not be deflected. She tried to get her husband to call his mother every Sunday night, but when he didn't, and Claire could just imagine her sweet boy, passive as granite. She's okay, Lauren, what do you want me to do about it? Lauren, who was properly brought up, made the phone call. We'd love for you to visit us, Claire. I bet, Claire thought. Oh, not until the semester ends. I just can't, but you all could come out here any time. It really wouldn't be suitable. Claire said nothing. I mean, it just wouldn't, Lauren said, polite and stubborn, and Claire felt sorry for her. Claire wouldn't want herself for a mother-in-law under the best of circumstances. I'd love to have you visit, Claire said. This wasn't exactly true, but she would certainly rather have them in her house than be someplace that had no William in it. And the boys' room is all set with the bunk beds and your room for you and Adam, and there's plenty of room. I hear Cirque du Soleil will be here in a few weeks. And Claire and Margaret will take little Nelson before he's too old to be seen in public with two old ladies. And Lauren's voice dropped, and Claire knew she was walking from the living room where she was watching TV and folding laundry into a part of the house where Adam couldn't hear her. It doesn't matter how much room there is. Your house is like a mausoleum. How am I supposed to explain that to the boys, Claire? Am I supposed to say Grandma loved Grandpa William so much she keeps every single thing he ever owned or read or ate all around her? I don't mind if that's what you want to tell them. <clears throat> In fact, Claire thought, I'll tell them myself. Little Miss, let's call a spade a gardening implement. And she could hear William saying, darling, you are as clear and bright as vinegar, but not everyone wants their pipes cleaned. <laughs> I don't want to tell them that, Lauren said. I want, really, we all we just want for you to begin, you know, <clears throat> just to get on with your life a little bit. Claire said, and she thought she had never sounded more like Isabel, master of the even and elegant tone. I completely understand, Lauren. It is very good of you to call. And Lauren put the boys on, and they said exactly what they should. Hi, Grandma. Thanks for the Legos. And Claire put Post-its next to the kitchen calendar at the beginning of every month so she could send an educational toy to each grandchild so that no one could accuse her of neglecting them. <clears throat> and she walked, Lauren walked back into the living room and forced Adam to take the phone. And Claire said to him before he could speak, I'm all right, Adam, not to worry. And he said, I know. And Claire asked about his work and Lauren's classes and Jason's karate and the baby's teeth. And when she could just do nothing more, she said, oh, I'll let you go now, honey. And she sat on the floor with the phone still in her hand. 
One Sunday, her son Danny called and said, had you he heard about dad? And Claire's heart clutched, just as people describe. And when she didn't say anything, Danny cleared his throat and said, I thought you might have heard dad's getting married. And Claire was so relieved, she was practically giddy. Oh, that's wonderful, she said. That nice, tall woman who golfs? And Danny laughed. Almost everything you could say about his future stepmother pointed directly to the way she was not like his mother, particularly nice, tall, and golfs. And Claire got off the phone and sent Charles and his bride. She couldn't remember the woman's name, so she sent it to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Wexler, which had a nice old-fashioned ring to it. She sent them a big, pretty Tiffany vase of the kind that she had wanted when she married Charles. The only phone calls she made were to Isabel. She called in the early evening before Isabel turned in. There was nothing she didn't know about Isabel's habits. She dialed her number, William's old number, and when Isabel answered, she hung up, of course. Claire called Isabel about once a week after watching Widow's Walk, the most repulsive and irresistible show she had ever seen. Three, sometimes four women, sat around and said things like, it's not an ending, it's a beginning. What made it bearable to Claire was that the women were all ardent Catholics and not like her, except the discussion leader who was so obviously Jewish and from the Bronx that Claire had to Google her to discover she had a PhD in philosophical something and had converted to Catholicism after a personal tragedy. So Claire got to hear a woman who sounded a lot like her great Aunt Frida say, I pray for all widows and we must all keep on with our faith and never forget that Jesus meets every need. And Claire waited for the punchline for the woman to yank her cross off her neck and say, and if you believe that, blah, 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 I've got a bridge I'd like to sell you. But she never did. She did sometimes say in the testing, poking tone of a good rabbi, isn't it interesting that so many women saints come to their sainthood through being widows? Poor and desperate, alone in the world with no protection, but the sisters took them in and even educated their children. Isn't it interesting that widowhood led them to become saints and extraordinary women, to know themselves and Jesus better? And the other widows, the real Catholics, didn't look interested at all. The good-looking one in a red suit and red high heels kept reminding everyone that she was very recently widowed and young and pretty. And the other two, a garden gnome in baggy pants and black sneakers that didn't touch the floor, and a tall woman in a frilly blouse with her glasses taped together at the bridge, talked in genuinely heartbroken tones about their lives now that they were alone. And they rarely mentioned their husbands, although the gnome did say more than once that if she could forgive her late husband, anyone could forgive anyone. Claire dials as soon as the organ music dies down and Isabel picks up after one ring. Claire doesn't speak. Claire? Claire sighs. Hanging up was bad enough. Isabel? Isabel sighs as well. I saw Emily a few weeks ago. I dropped off a birthday present for baby Charlotte. She's beautiful. And Emily seems very happy. I mean, not to see me, but in general. Yes, she told me. I shouldn't have gone. Well, Isabel said, if you want to offer a relationship and generous gifts, it's up to Emily. Kurt's mother's dead. I guess it depends on how many grandmothers Emily wants baby Charlotte to have, regardless of who they are. There was really no one like Isabel. I guess it does. I mean, I'm not going to presume. I'm not going to be dropping in all the time with a box of cookies and a hand-knit sweater. I wouldn't think so, Claire. Oh, Isabel, I miss you. Good night, Claire. When Claire gets off the phone, there's a raccoon in her kitchen on the counter. It although Claire immediately thinks he is eating a slice of bacon bread. He's holding it in his small, nimble, and very human black hands. He looks at her over the edge of the bread like a man peering over his glasses, a fat, bold, imperturbable man with a twinkle in his dark eyes. And even though she knows better, even though William would have been very annoyed at her for doing so, Claire says softly, William? <laughs> the raccoon doesn't answer. And Claire smiles. She wouldn't have wanted the raccoon to say, Claire? <laughs> because then she would have had to call her sons and have herself committed. And although this is not the life she hoped to have, it's certainly better than being in a psychiatric hospital. And the raccoon has started on his second slice of bread. Claire would like to put out the orange marmalade and a little plate of honey. William never ate peanut butter, but Claire wants to open a jar for the raccoon. She's read that they love peanut butter. She doesn't want the raccoon to leave. In an ideal world, the raccoon would give Claire advice. 
he would speak to her like Quan Yin, the Buddhist goddess of compassion and mercy. Or he would speak to her like St. Paula, the patron saint of widows, about whom Claire has heard so much lately. And Claire says, without moving, and why is St. Paula a saint? She dumps her four kids at a convent after the youngest dies. She runs off the Hajira with St. Jerome. How is that a saint? You know, shitty mothers all over America would love to dump their kids and travel. <laughs> and the raccoon nibbles at the crust. Oh, it's very hard, Claire says, sitting down slowly, not too close. I miss him so much. I didn't know. I didn't know I would be like this that this is what happens when you love someone like that. I had no idea. No one says there's no happy ending at all. No one says if you could look ahead, you might want to stop now. I know, I know. I know I was lucky. I was luckier than anyone to have had what I had. I know now, I do, really. And the raccoon picks up two large crumbs and tosses them into his mouth. He scans the counter and the canisters and looks closely at Claire. He hops down from the counter to the kitchen stool and onto the floor and he strolls out the kitchen door. Claire told Nelson about the raccoon and they encouraged him with heels of bread and plastic containers of peanut butter leading up the kitchen steps, but he didn't come back. She told Margaret Slater, who said she was lucky not to have gotten rabies, and she told Adam and Danny, who said the same thing. She bought a stuffed animal raccoon with round black velvet paws, much nicer than the actual raccoons, and she put him on her bed with the rhino and the little bird and William's big pillows. And she told little Charlotte raccoon stories when she came to babysit, because in the end, how could Emily say no to a babysitter six blocks away and free and generous with her time? And she even told Emily, who paused and said with a little concern that raccoons could be very dangerous. I don't know if you heard, Emily said. My mother's getting married, a wonderful man. And Claire bounced baby Charlotte on her knee. Oh, good. Then everyone is happy. Thank you. And I always point out to people that I was a therapist before I was a writer, so I actually can stand here for 50 minutes of complete silence <laughs> if necessary. P people are not so spare and skimpy with their words in therapy sessions. There's a lot of, um, which is perfectly understandable. That's why you pay people to listen. But I think it's my own taste. I like being able, the greatest thing in the world for me was when I was uh, younger and I read War and Peace and there's this great description of this sort of scene in the door drawing room and the skirts are rustling over the parquet floor and the golden light with the dust motes is coming through and somebody's playing the piano forte and it's extremely detailed. And the next line is seven years later. And that I thought was, that's what I would like to be able to do. I would like to skip all the dull parts. Not the description, not the detail, not the things that create the scene or the conversation, but all the other stuff that is not so interesting. I did think to myself, oh, maybe I won't have to have eight wheat threshing scenes in my novel, you know. Um, so that was always it. I just wanted to be able to pick out the things that mattered most and never doubt that my readers were smart, you know, as smart if not smarter than me. I think that the tension is very much from how the difference, the gap between how people feel and what they do. I, I sometimes say about my writing, I'm always interested in that space between the sidewalk and the street. You know, it's, it's that that is so interesting to me. The gap between what people say and what they really feel, between what they think and what they really feel, between what they tell you and what they know to be true. You know, between what they remember and what they really remember all that stuff, and so that leads to a lot of tension in people's actions, and also, if there aren't two stories, this is, this, is the, this is the professorial part of me, if there aren't two stories, nothing interesting is happening. Right, of all people, um, Will Durant, in his sort of, that big thing on history, um, says, you know, the history of human beings is the life on the riverbanks in which people cook and clean and raise babies and feed their families and grow things and catch things. 
and the blood of river, the, the river of blood that runs through it. And that's how I think of, of, of fiction, too. It's, it's domestic life. It's everything that goes on. It's everything that is every day. And then there is that thing, which is big and powerful and sometimes terrible and sometimes great, that runs all the way through it. And I think you always want to have both. So it's not an anecdote. It's a, it's a story. Lots of things that I write disturb me. I, 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 I'm very sympathetic. I actually write with my eyes closed sometimes because I am myself so embarrassed. And um, it's true. And I tend not to read those parts to audiences because it's embarrassing to me. And it's also equally embarrassing that I should blush while reading my own work scenes that I have made happen. Um, but um, yeah, terrible things happen. You know, people are taken by surprise. They, good people do bad things. People do things that they regret terribly. Gosh, just 15 seconds after they finish doing them. But nevertheless, those things are interesting and sometimes illuminating to read about. So yes, I close my eyes and I pretend that nobody will ever read these terrible things that I have these people do. And then, you know, I just keep writing. Um, I think it is everything like that except the part about it being an escape. I, I'm sure that must be great. I have no idea what it's like to write and feel like it's a wonderful escape. But the question was, do I write about people that I know? Do I make it up? Is it an escape? Um, it, it, it never feels like an escape. It always feels <clears throat> like being the farmer of a very small subsistence farm where there is likely to be no rain anytime soon. So, <laughs> uh, so escape, no. Um, you know, reading P.D. James is an escape. Writing my work is not. But I think that writers can never be entirely honest about whether or not it's people you know or people you make up whole cloth. I will say that I have had people respond to certain characters by saying, I love that character. I know you must have had a Mrs. So-and-so in your life. And I had no Mrs. So-and-so. I think the reason she was so alive on the page is because I had so longed to have had somebody like that, but had nobody like that at all. Or other times people will say, <coughs> I had a, 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 an early short story in which a, a, a woman has a schizophrenic sister. It's very big, blonde, very crazy uh, woman. And my sister, my actual sister, used to come to the readings in her smart little suits and her four-inch heels, I think just so she could say, I'm fine. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's always, it's always a mix. It's, it's somebody's hair or it's somebody's look or it's somebody's way of pausing when they talk or it's something that has just appeared to me. Um, you know, there are things that you can't help. I think if you could have, as a writer, if I, if I had all of my work and I had some little computer program to take out certain words, I probably would do that because I do notice over time that there are certain, they're not themes that repeat themselves, they're just tiny little details because they are things that I like. You know, there is, there is always certain kinds of, of, of classic jazz. There's always, people are always cooking because I like to cook. People usually have siblings because I have a sibling. People you often have children because I have children. And so you don't want to mine the same territory over and over again. On the other hand, you write as you are. And there is no hiding it is what I have sadly come to conclude. I guess how do the characters come sort of full formed or do I discover them as I am writing along? For the short stories, they are often a little more formed because not, really, not much happens in my short stories. I, I, said, you know, I said to somebody, my short stories are like 1973 French films. You know, people have dinner, somebody looks at somebody over the table, somebody kisses somebody in the garage, somebody folds the napkins. It's like that's the whole story. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of that in my fiction. There's a lot of nothing much happens except people feel things deeply and, you know, they have interesting conversations. But in my novels, I feel morally obliged to have something take place over the course of 300 pages. And um, the, that, that usually leads me to have sketches of characters, but it's, it's like life, actually. The events tend to reveal who they are. 
and sometimes I have to write the thing that happens to see what they're going to do. It's not like Alice Walker used to say. She, you know, she used to say, when I'm writing a novel, my characters walk into the house and sit down on the end of my bed, which I thought, that must be fantastic. But <laughs> nobody to whom I am not related ever does that. And um, I think um, you discover them. You want to think about them as much as possible. It's actually the hardest thing. The hardest thing is to hear them in your head hardest thing for me is to hear the character's voice. It's not, it's not my voice that gives me trouble. I write the way I write. You can, you know, you read my work, you can cut, find a sentence in this book or that book and you go, oh yeah, well, I, you know, it's the same person who wrote that. But it's finding their voice is always the hardest thing. And until you do that, until I do that, I'm just sort of mucking about, you know, feeling doomed, yeah, actually. <laughs> um, the question is sort of, you know, do I teach, do I teach you know, the craft of writing, or do I teach sort of, you know, encountering the bigger world? Um, I wish them all the luck in the world in encountering the great large world, and, you know, there's no hurry. I mean, they're kids, and, you know, they'll get the shit kicked out of them soon enough. There's no reason for me to hurry them up. Um, I mean, it's bad enough that they're in my class. <laughs> so, my class is craft, craft, craft. That's, that is, I mean, we do read, and I have them, I just had them read Bartleby the Scrivener, which I thought was probably going to kill them. Um, but, and, and, you know, fair enough, because if Melville was writing in the modern world, that story would be 10 pages shorter, because, you know, at some point you're like, I get it. Now, I'm pretty clear I understand. He'd prefer not to, you know, okay. But um, you can't, what I would say is you can't teach talent. But I can teach craft. I can teach people how to tell the difference between a good sentence and a bad sentence, no matter who writes it. I can teach them how to appreciate a sentence by Stephen King and a sentence by Jane Austen. And to understand what makes it good covers an enormous range of writers. You know, there's such a wide range of good writers, it's, not, it's like they're not even writing in the same language. They're doing completely different things. But they can learn to understand what makes it good. And, um, and then finally, I can teach them how to edit their own work and how to read as a writer and not just as a reader. But I always tell them, you know, do not come to my class to be anointed and do not come to my class to become talented. Because it's like, first of all, I have no idea. They're, they're 20 years old. I don't think they're going to be talented or not. They might turn out to be brilliant and only appear to me as completely hopeless wastes of space, you know? You never know. Or somebody writes something absolutely fantastic, they're 19 years old, it's 1,500 words, you think, this is the real thing, and they never do it again. You know, some of it is talent, and some of it is how hard somebody wants to work. Um, uh, my friend Michael Cunningham always quotes Marilyn Monroe, who said about her career, I wasn't the prettiest, and I wasn't the best, but I worked harder than anybody else. And, and, that, and I, I actually believe that although you can't do anything about how much of a gift you get, you certainly make a decision about how hard you are prepared to work and how seriously you are prepared to take it. You do this all in one semester? Mm. <laughs> I know, poor things, they're exhausted. No, they just look like gerbils at the end. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> what writers do I admire? Um, I'm really a book clerk at heart. There, I, I read mysteries. I read what, what we like to call literary fiction. Um, I read a lot of poetry. So it's a really long list. I could start with the poets, because I always feel bad for poets. I just feel like this is just so hard. It's, this makes writing my kind of stuff look like a walk in the park. Um, I really like Mark Doty. I like Jane Hirschfield. I like Auden. I like Emily Dickinson. I like. Uh, Donald Hall, especially that book without. I love Jane Kenyon. I love Zimborska. Um, I won't bore you with like all the mystery writers I like because that's really a very large group, but only of interest to other people who like to read mysteries. <laughs> Everybody else is like, why would you even okay, mention that? Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Val McDermott, P.D. P. James, Elizabeth George, Ed McBain. Um, that's, that's probably good enough for starters. Early Ian Rankin. <laughs> Uh, oh, and, and um, she, just wrote, uh, she just wrote two books in the last two years. I think her last name is French, Into the Woods. Very good. 
Very good, very smart. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I just read um, Empty Family, Empty Families, the Tobin book. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, I liked it very, very much. Uh, and um, I'm just trying to see my nightstand. Um, what the hell else was it? Oh, there's something else I was reading. Oh, and I'm I'm reading over my husband's shoulders. I'm reading the 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 Tony Jutt book, not the memoir, but the one. Thus fails the. I can't. Somebody who read it must know the title. It has land in the title. Ill fares the land. Thank you very much. So there you have it. <laughs> You're welcome. What about mysteries? I think that for me, really, there is something so comforting and delightful about the world in which terrible things happen at, a regularly, pl at regularly plotted intervals for my entertainment. Um, I find that very, very cozy and comforting. Um, and then people solve it, all is well. Um, some hard lessons have been learned. I've explored the English or the Scottish or the American countryside. Well, it certainly is. I did actually write a mystery. It's the first thing I ever wrote was a mystery. Uh, this, is, all right, this is a great story. So I write the mystery because I decided not to become a psychoanalyst. So <clears throat> clearly the next step was to become a mystery novelist, <laughs> having never written anything before. So I start writing because I feel I understand mysteries. I know how the, I, I get it. So I write this mystery, and I send it to my only reader, who is my former high school English teacher, who loves me more than anything. <laughs> and he goes, darling, the characters are so fresh and alive, and the dialogue is so funny and original. I don't really meet, read mysteries. Shouldn't there be more than one suspect? <laughs> and I thought, that is an excellent point. <laughs> and I can't think of one. So I, I, I finished it, and the short stories started showing up, and I did actually sell the mystery and the first collection of short stories, and I then thought the mystery was so bad, I bought it back from my publisher, because I just felt that there does not need to be more crap in the world. So I'm a great admirer of, of, of good mysteries, I really am. In terms of what inspired me to write about Claire and Isabel, I think it wasn't so much about this relationship between these two women, although I do have some very, very close female friends, and to think about losing those friendships is, 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 is terrible. It would be like entering a desert. Um, but I think what I was really thinking about was how much you have to lose as you get older. You know, we think of young people as sort of throwing things over and going far away and changing jobs and changing their lives, but the people to whom it seems to me that's enormously complicated and costly and emotionally demanding and occasionally heroic, often, you know, misguided, stupid and terrible, but occasionally heroic, um, are, are older people. And I... I just found myself thinking so much. I spent a lot of time actually with that last story because I kept thinking, <laughs> my notes to myself, my outlines for short stories usually say things like, you know, woman with glasses goes to grocery store, something terrible happens. I mean, those are, that's like the entire outline. And for this story, I had, it, it said, William dies, <clears throat> Claire survives, who else does she lose? That was the outline for the story. So it wasn't so much the tension between the women as, as just this idea that there are losses you have to live with. And I, <laughs> I like writing about that. You know, I like writing about the happiness and I like writing about the scars. Those are, those are the things I tend to write about. I would say actually my relationship to the, with humor in the stories tends to be the other way around. When I look back at some of my early stories, there are occasion, I, I, I tried, but I didn't always succeed. There are occasional funny lines that a character has that I find myself thinking, I'm not sure this really comes from this character. You know, it's a great line, it's very funny. And so, you know, I just always think to myself, you know, too cute by half. And so my goal as a writer is actually now to control the humor the other way. It, it, it's never that I have to inject it, but sometimes I have to take it out. 
you know, people cannot be clever all the time. Sometimes it's just terrible and hard and people say dopey things. And I have to make sure I allow them to say dopey, although interesting things. Um, and, and not, for me it was hard when I was starting to write, I just had to not hide behind that. Because if you can write a good sentence, it's, 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 it's a very useful skill, obviously, but it can also be a cover-up. You don't want to have all icing, no cake. No, 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 that's, that, that's a very fair question, and I always do feel um, a little nervous when I see people reading along when, no, 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 that, uh, it's not that you are the only person who has ever done this. Yeah, well, the other people who do it ha don't have that excuse. <laughs> they, I, I can see clearly that they're Americans and they, 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 they don't have to do that. But the, but, but the truth is that when, there are a couple of reasons that I changed the words. Once in a while, there's a word that I wrote that I have felt since that book came out was the wrong word. There's one like that in the collection Income to Me and it's in, Silver water, and I finally got it changed in subsequent editions. But at some point, I like named the kind of pills the person took, and I just wanted it to say white pills. And every time I read, I'd be like, pow, pow, you know, because I was so agitated every time I saw it on the page. So when I'm reading, I change things for a couple of reasons. Sometimes I lead details because hearing is different than seeing it on the page. And what can be very full when you're reading it can be a little long when you're hearing it. So there's that. Um, I can't stand giving like an overly long reading. It just seems to me so rude and terrible. Um, sometimes there are words that I don't pronounce really well. And if I'm reading in the middle of a sentence, they're going to trip me up. And so I just don't say them um, because it's too difficult. Um, and then the third reading, is, the third reason is that there are words like and, and so, and also the use of certain tenses, which when you're reading out loud, because the person has not been immersed in the book, you're just here now, you weren't looking at the preceding 10 pages, you know, that I, it's necessary to sort of relocate the reader from time to time to say her son Danny, whereas in the sentence it just says Danny, because people are staying with me, especially with a story like this in which there are a lot of characters. Um, I need to sort of use somebody's name again or I need to use the relationship between them. So it, it usually has to do with w what I regard as the needs of reading rather than how I put it on the page. How I put it on the page is how I hear it. That is my strongest intention. But when people come to listen, I want to make it as, as good as possible for that. So all the time. Um, the future of the novel and the short story, that should probably wrap it up for the <laughs> evening, I think. Um, that's right, drinks on the house. I think, um, I think we will, people who write will go on writing. There will maybe not be an explosion of people who read, I suspect. I think that, I often think that people who do the kind of writing I do, we will be in 25 or 35 years like people who make their own shoes. I mean, people will think it's charming, you know, and they'll go, really? Oh, it's wonderful. Laces and everything. Um, I hope not, but that's, I, that seems quite possible to me. I think people will read in different forms, sometimes in forms that I'm not crazy about, but you know, who am I to say people shouldn't read on Kindles? You know, you're traveling, my mother-in-law goes on a long trip, she, you know, she's 75 years old, God bless her, she's not gonna carry 40 books with her. How can I not be thrilled that she is bringing 40 books with her to read, even if it's on the Kindle? So I think all those things will change. I think people's attention spans have already changed. But as I often say, you know, I'm sure that at some point in the past, after the invention of electricity, people like you and me were sitting there going, oh, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. You know, you can turn those lights on and off, and now you've got television, and nobody plays the harpsichord anymore. And it's true, those, there are real losses. On the other hand, it doesn't matter what we think of it. It is already different. And so I think writers will keep writing. And um, 
I, I, I have more questions about what will happen in publishing. I suspect writers will keep writing and readers will keep reading. So on that note, thank you all very much for coming and for reading.